Hi, everyone. So I hope this will be not the very hard stuff, so, um, but um, yeah, we will try to entertain you as well. Um, so, um, yeah, we are here today to talk to you about um, React State Management. And we have been using React State Management Redux uh, for the last two years in our company now. And we just recently uh, had uh, made the decision to use MobX and another department of our company. And yeah, we had a lot of discussions about this. Why should we do it and how we should do it? And should we stay with Redux? Should we try MobX? And we are always trying something new, and we had a lot of arguments about it, why we should use it. And we just wanted to share that with you because um, our web applications are getting ever more complex, as you might have noticed. And um, yeah, the choosing the right state management for you, for your project, should be not the biggest concern for you when doing a new project. So we hope we can make React state management great for you again and not be a big pain. So, um, just a short introduction. I'm Martin Westfall. I've been a software engineer for the last two and a half years at About You Now, and uh, just recently I started um, working as the tech evangelist, uh, tech evangelist and tech event manager at About You. And yeah, now I'm trying to spread the knowledge and our experiences that we make in our company and talk about it. Hi, I'm also Amir. I've been the lead developer of mobile application at About You. I'm also here to share some experiences that we got uh, through these years working with different state management in a larger scale application and hopefully give you some insight on that. Okay, so um, what we want to do here is um, I will try to talk about um, the different ways to handle your state in a, in a React app. Um, in general and just comparing the ways that you can do that and then Ami will give you some insights of what we've learned in the last two years using Redux and how you can improve some stuff in Redux. Um, before we start I just wanted to get a sh short show of hands. Who of you is using React? <laughs> what a surprise. Okay, um, no surprise there. So who is using React with um, Redux? Ah, that's more than I thought. Who's using it with MobX, like mainly? That's, yeah, the min yeah, minority. <laughs> uh, who is using it with the usual, like the normal state handling of React? Wow, there's actually people doing that, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, great, good. Um, okay, so um, I actually want to start off with that, and I don't want to get into that because I think, as we saw here, everyone knows React, and there's not a lot to it. So basically, if you have the normal way to handle your state, you have all these components, and you have um, child components of them, and whenever you want to pass down your um, state, you will have to do that via the props, and you will pass them down to the child components, and if something changes in that one of those child components, you actually have to declare a handle function, which will then enable you to pass that, to bubble all that state up all the way to the root element where you actually came from with that state. And that gets even more con uh, confusing if you add another component somewhere on the way. And I know this is like a really small example, but can you, you can already see how messy this gets at some point. And um, so that is that. And um, with MobX, you actually have a store where you can have a state in it. And um, that state can have derivations, which can be really anything that um, computes your data. So you have those computed values, but also a variety of other things. And all of those, like the state, and as well as those derivations, can then be observed by certain reactions. Those reactions can also be a variety of things, not just your components, but also, um, for example, a console logging stuff and also some external dependencies that you can um, trigger. And each of those reactions can then itself trigger an action and update the state for itself. And that way you can um, have this closed circle. And the cool thing about that is that these 
reactions are actually uh, triggering not just uh, implicitly, like you don't have to fire an action as you would do in Redux, but those can actually mutate the state right, uh, right away. And that way, it's way easier to handle that, or it's more, way more approachable, as I think. So I know this sounds really abstract for the people that haven't been in, uh, looked into MobX yet, and that is for a reason, and I want to quote the MobX documentation here. People often use MobX as an alternative for Redux, but please note that MobX is just a library to solve a technical problem and not an architecture or even a state container. So it doesn't make sense to approach MobX state handling in the same way you would do with Redux or in a, a at least similar fashion, but you don't have to do it. You don't have this extra complexity that Redux is forcing you to do. So going to Redux, um, of course you have those stores, and in those stores you have your state. Everybody of us knows that. So um, those states can then uh, define selectors onto uh, uh, those your components can then define selectors to access a certain part of your state, and each component can trigger actions with a type and a payload to that, and that action then goes into a reducer, and the reducer will get the current state and update the state accordingly to the type of your action and the payload. Simple as that. So, um, you can also define middlewares, which Amir will talk about in a second, and you can also edit some external RPs via middlewares there. So, talking about the location of your state. So, of course, in React, you have your state in the components. So, even if every component can have its state for itself, you definitely have one single source of truth where the state is living, and that actually can also be true for MobX. So in MobX, you can have the same thing. So you can have your state as well in, as you can have it globally, you can also have it in, a, in your local component, uh, as you can have multiple stores, um, even though that is not advised. And they also advise you to do it as you would do it in Redux, to have just one single store. So if you're using multiple stores, you can do that. It doesn't force you to have one single store, but it is supposed, like, you're, it's recommended to do it in a one single store. And with Redux, uh, we also have this one single store approach where you have one centralized um, way of s storing your state. Also, what I just found out, you can also have multiple stores in Redux. It's just not really, it's really, really bad if you do that. Uh, yeah, just saying you can do that in Redux as well. Okay, so mutability. Um, we actually had kind of a discussion on that. Um, so in React, is the state of a React component mutable or immutable? Raise your hands if you think it's mutable. Okay, one, two, three, four. There's some more getting there. Okay, but the majority thinks it's immutable. Okay, that's also after some, dis some discussion what we figured. And um, yeah. Uh, we said that, okay, even though you can mutate your state in your component directly, React will not notice it, and that way we said, okay, it's immutable because every time you set, do you, this is weird with the voice. Okay, so every time you um, use set state um, in your component to update your state, you will um, have an immutable state and it will update the entire state. Um, so. With MobX, you actually have the ability to directly access your state and edit it, um, but you can also configure it in a way to um, enforce um, actions and that way have the same approach that Redux actually is forcing you um, by default on it. And that's actually really useful if you have larger projects, so at one, you can start off with really smaller ones and then go um, to that pattern as well. So Redux is immutable. That's the basic concept of Redux. You have actions that update your state um, with payload. And yeah, that's just the pattern that it's following. So the community with React is obviously the biggest ones because the other ones are just additions to that. And um, you have a lot of support. And you have actually so many libraries and so many problem solutions to anything you can really think of. And uh, 
that is different with Movix. So Movix is actually not really way younger than Redux. I think there were, there's like the the release of version 1.0 is like three or four months apart, but uh, it has just recently become a bit more of uh, a phenomenon uh, in the past few months or year. <coughs> and then there's Redux. Uh, that's obviously has quite a large community and you can find uh, solutions and any library for a lot of uh, things there and it's, uh, I think it's the most approachable thing uh, if you have any problems there and you can share it with the community. So uh, performance, there's actually, we don't have any metrics here just by uh, our feeling we try to define of how good this is and um, so React out of the box is good, like we take that as a standard. Um, you can do a lot of improvements on the way that the React state, manage, uh, state handling works and when it is updated. But um, Movex actually out of the box works a lot better performance wise. And you can still do a lot of the um, improvements you could do for the React. You could also do for Movex. So try to figure out when your state actually has um, like valid has a valid change that you want to trigger and then update your component only then. And Redux um, is not as performant as Movex, but you can also do a lot of stuff uh, that Amir will talk about in a second to improve that. Okay, so the main topic, I think, whenever you ask someone, why should I use Redux over Movex is the logging. So I think um, just starting off with React, there is, of course, the React Dev tools and you can inspect and update all of the, like you can update the state and inspect the state and your props of any component. Additionally to that, in Movex DevTools, you can inspect all the observers and observables, you can track reactions and actions and you have a nice log of anything that happened in your actions and reactions and you can actually inspect the um, Movex state tree which is really great for larger applications. So, Movex, um, uh, Redux uh, logging, obviously that's always the point if anybody says that. So you can inspect every state and any action payload all the time. You have this time travel by can uh, where you can actually go back in time and go to a certain state of your application and see what it was like back then. And you can actually also import other states into your application. For example, if a user has some problem you can ask them. I've never heard of anyone doing that, but can, in theory you could ask them to send you uh, your, their state and then you could debug that. But I've never heard of that, uh, that anyone would do that. And um, so if you also, uh, also what's great is if you change a reducer, for example, um, each staged action in your current application will b get updated right away and you can see what happened with this new reducer. <coughs> okay, so um, just if you approach a new project, you should always consider two things, I think. So, of course, all of those things I've talked about just now, but also I think the learning curve is really important. So, if you think about the native way that React is handling state, that's really approachable and you will have to learn about that in MobX and Redux as well. So, the learning curve is not as steep, um, even though I, can th I think that React is, um, has quite a learning curve um, for beginners. Um, but it just doesn't, I, th I think, it doesn't scale really well with bigger, uh, with bigger and really complex applications. But with Movex that actually changes, so Movex is really approachable because it doesn't enforce all those extra patterns on you and you can really easily get started with Movex. So that way the learning curve is a bit steeper as you have to know about observables, observers and all this stuff and the actions, but it's uh, way more approachable than Redux and um, it can handle quite complex applications as well. So then you can actually, as I said, enforce actions in Redux, uh, in Movex, uh, which enables you, which adds an extra um, layer of complexity on it because you are um, mostly will follow the same patterns that Redux is using, but as you already mostly learned MobX from the ground up and you haven't used that before, it's not as hard of a learning curve as you would have with Redux. And that actually scales quite good for way more complex applications then. So Redux, 
I think has the steepest learning curve. So especially if you're completely new to React and Redux, this will um, have quite a would, could be quite a challenge. Um, but of course, as it uses all these patterns to structure your uh, state and everything, it also is really capable for really complex applications. Um, and as a recommendation, I would always start off with the normal state handling and then maybe for smaller projects go with uh, MobX. And if you have really large scale projects, you should go right away with uh, Redux. So Redux has been used by us for the last two years now. And um, Ami will now share some insights with you that we have gained. OK, thank you. Um, so I have prepared some logos for you here. So as you can see, it seems like we are talking about electrons and atomic bombs uh, and bonds, not bombs, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, but in fact, React is much more complex than that. So let's talk about React. So uh, I'm going to give you some tips uh, and like the learnings that we had on how we can structure our Redux store so it would be more approachable and easier to work with how we can implement our logic for the Redux store with a way of storytelling that would be uh, actually the same as uh, the way that you get uh, your work from your manager or your tickets that you have to work on, and how you can fix the performance problems that might happen with uh, Redux with using reselect and memoized functions. So, uh, the first thing we have to keep in mind that uh, computers can always read our code. It doesn't matter uh, how we are writing them. As long as there is no error, the computers can uh, execute that. But the problem for us is to work in with other humans and other developers. So we have to keep in mind that we have to have a structure that is scalable and it is easy for other people to jump into and work with you and un understand what you have written down. So for example, here we have a, a, a state tree of a, a Redux application. Basically, whenever we start a new application, the state would be a simple, just a reducer. Then as time grows and our application grows, the state would uh, uh, increase in complexity. And we have to start separating these uh, different parts and different entities of our state into different reducers using combined reducers. And whenever those parts also increase in complexity, we have to add, uh, we have to break them down even more, and if needed, again, even more. So for example, with this approach, if uh, we have a problem in, for example, one of our products, or a product page that we have, we already know where to look for it, and where can uh, we find the bug that, uh, there is in our application. So in, in that way, it uh, really helps to uh, speed up actually the development and finding the bugs. And also, so we talked about how we structure our uh, data in Redux store, but uh, the point is in a real world application, normally we are not uh, getting all of your data as you want it because the API you are working with, it's not only intended for you, probably it's intended for a lot of applications, so they, uh, so they, they are not working exactly as you, as you hoped they would. So for example, here we have a product endpoint. It gives us a list of products. Then we have a category endpoint that gives us a category ID that has a list of products. And as we can see, it already has some redundant parts. And also, then we get a sorting endpoint that, with machine learning, our BI uh, team is working on it and like uh, trying to sort a product that might be more valuable to the user on top. So right now, we are only working for, the, for showing a product, but we have the data to show that product in three different parts. And if we save this data in our store, it would be way more complicated for uh, the front-end logic to sh show that data. So what we can do here is to normalize and uh, have a structure that actually we, uh, makes sense for us in the front-end uh, part and just uh, make the, uh, all of this data into one uh, data that we can use. Here's an example for that. So we have our products. Uh, they are categorized by product ID. 
and they also have category ID and sorting on them automatically. So this would be the only thing that our developers would work on the front end part uh, uh, instead of having to work with three different data sources. So we talked about uh, how we can structure our data, but uh, th this is only the structure part of our Redux application. What about uh, the logic that goes into the Redux? That's when the sagas uh, come into uh, play. So sagas uh, are, uh, if you uh, search them on dictionary, saga actually means a story. So that's what we aim to achieve with sagas. We want to tell a story, actually. So, for example, imagine you have a, a product manager that, that is requesting a feature from you. He actually looks like my product manager, except that <laughs> he's a bit uh, more taller. He's two meters tall and like a rugby player. So I always want to uh, do whatever he asks me to do and uh, don't uh, do anything extra and make sure that everything that is requested uh, is actually implemented in, a, in the application. So for example, here we want an onboarding feature in our application. This feature would launch on our app start and ask uh, from the user to either log in, pick a gender, or uh, skip the onboarding altogether. And then ask for push permissions from our user. And then says thank you for completing the onboarding. So here it, uh, it's a mock of he uh, what it would uh, look like, and here we can see that we can actually uh, structure our app into our, uh, some simple stories. So for example, here, here we have our main story, that would be the at app start story. Then on, for example, first chapter, we start uh, with the tracking of that, uh, uh, we start with the tracking or other stuff that we want to do on the beginning of our app, our app. And the second chapter would be our onboarding feature that we just talked about. So we simply say, if the user is new to our application, run the onboarding story for that user. And here is how that onboarding uh, story would look like. So as you can remember, the ticket we got is basically looking like uh, this function that we are uh, writing, except that it is right it was written in human readable uh, form and this is machine readable form but uh, again they are basically the same thing so that at the beginning of it uh, we are asking our navigator to show an onboarding screen then we we hit the race and race is actually we are just waiting for a user to di to do do an action. For example, we, as we can remember, we wanted uh, from our user to either log in into our application, pick a gender, or uh, skip the onboarding. So we wait here, and when the user uh, do one of these actions, we actually have the winner for our race, and it goes into our user choice. So in the next lines, we can see, uh, we can say, if the user has picked a gender or user logged in into our application, just says thanks uh, as the, our ticket uh, wanted from us. Otherwise, just remember to ask later this information from the user. And, there, and then at the end, we are asking the user for push permissions. This is also another sub-story that runs. And when it is finished, we are finished with our onboarding story. And we can continue with our main story, which would be our application story completely. So this is how we also uh, can simplify the logic that goes into uh, our Redux store. So we have the structure, we have the logic, but we also need to keep it performant. So what can actually decrease the performance of a React application? As we, as we know, Re React components are like uh, just uh, functions that get some prop and render something. And if those prop changes, they render something else, or they render something exactly the same, even though the, uh, the prop might change. So how we can, uh, so as Martin said, uh, when we fire an action in Redux store, this action goes to our reducers, we compute a new state, and we get a, a new state object. This is how we connect our state to our React component with a map state to prop. 
So here, for example, we have a state and we want to get all the odd numbers uh, from that state and pass it as a prop to our component. This seems uh, fairly simple and the selector for that uh, state is just get odd numbers here that just filtering and getting uh, all the odd numbers from our state. But there is a problem here. The problem is that uh, filter function. Because every time we fire an action in store, this uh, get odd numbers would fire again and we filter again through our list of numbers. And every time we filter through uh, the list of numbers, we get a new array. So first time we get the first array and second time we get the second array. But this array looks the same, but they are not actually the same because filter always returns a new reference. And this new reference uh, for React is a problem because React doesn't look into your object. It just checks the reference. If they are the same, it doesn't render. If they have changed the reference, then it uh, triggers a re-render. And that can, actu uh, can actually decrease our performance quite a lot. So to fix this problem, uh, the only thing we have to do is that our get odd numbers function shouldn't return a new array every time if nothing has changed. And there, there is already a solution for that. It is called memoization. So basically we just uh, call that function once and save the return to the return value of that function into memory. And the next time we call that function, we don't run the computation, we only return the uh, saved state that we already had. So here is uh, Reselect. Reselect is uh, a library that actually does memoization for us in selectors and it is very simple to use and uh, we, we think it, uh, it's a good solution to solve that problem in Redux for us. So here we break uh, our selectors into two parts. So we have a selector to get all the numbers from our state and the second part we, we, have a, we are creating a selector that gets an input and that input would be our numbers and that is the function we already had, uh, we already have having on top. And the second function is our memoized function. So this function would only run once uh, and we save the value for this function and when uh, we have the value, the next time we are running this function, we just return the reference to the value we already have in our, me uh, uh, in our memory. So th this, uh, uh, this can fix the problem of re-rendering and wasted renders in React. And imagine if you have an, an app with thousands of components mounted and you fire an action and every time you are rendering all those components without even need, needing a re-render. So these, these are uh, some of our insights that we got uh, using Redux in our applications and we hope the, these comparisons and uh, this insight uh, help you to make an easier choice for your next application and for in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. We <laughs> might have time for one super quick question from Slido, if we can bring up Slido for a moment. Yes, yeah, so let's just do the first one. Uh, the mutable state is a pro or con of MobX. What do you think? Oh, that really depends. Um, so. MobX, I think, is nice to use if you have those mutable state. Um, it makes it more approachable. So you don't have to worry about the actions that get fired and everything. And it takes that extra complexity that Redux has built in and enforces you to do out of there. And that's why that's actually part of why MobX is so much more approachable to people that haven't been into state management before. So. Um, yeah, I think in the beginning it definitely is a pro. So if you have a new application, it's a smaller application, but you want to have some state management in there and don't want to do the native state handling of React, which I could understand. Um, 
you should, you should, I think it's a pro and you could start with that and at some point if you think, ah, oh, I got so familiar with MobX, you can still configure MobX in a way that it doesn't allow you to do that anymore and that way um, you actually can try to follow the same pattern as Redux does. But I think in the beginning it definitely is a pro because it makes the f um, library just way more approachable.